This is Making a Scientist, the podcast by young scientists for young scientists, featuring cutting edge science and all of the life and work advice you'll ever need to succeed. It's brought alive by the brilliant scientists and it's hosted by me, Alex Hainsco. This week, my guest is Dr. David Miller, who's a resident hack fellow at the Imperial College Advanced Hack Space. Originally from New Zealand, David moved to and from opposite sides of the world through various academic posts before settling into his role as a Hackspace fellow. As a resident hacker, David's job is to use alternative and sometimes unconventional approaches to solve all manner of multidisciplinary problems encompassing engineering, chemistry, electronics, material science, physics and beyond. In this episode, hear how David came across this role after becoming frustrated with the constraints of academia and hear examples of how he's able to be creative as a hacker. If you find yourself struggling with a research project and you're not sure how to bring it to life, hackers are on hand to help. Let's find out more. David, thank you very much for, for joining uh, joining me this morning. Thank you. Um, I wondered if I could start this podcast by uh, asking you to just explain what a hack fellow is, because you, you know, this isn't a typical job. So what is a hack fellow? Yeah, sure, sure thing, Alex. Well, thanks, <laughs> thanks for inviting me along. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, my job description is a hack fellow. So this, uh, this is a role that's, uh, that exists at the Imperial College Advanced Hack Space. Um, it's, uh, I suppose it's quite, quite a diverse role. It's in some ways related to, uh, uh, like research, um, like workshop lab technicians, um, that sort of thing, all, all sort of rolled into one. So, mm. um, but basically at, at the space, we, we have a whole, a whole bunch of people from all, all sorts of parts of Imperial College. So be they like undergraduate students with, uh, with projects, be they, um, uh, students or staff members with like sort of spin out. Uh, or, or startup ideas, um, uh, like researchers at very various different stages. So, mm. um, you know, PhD, PhD students, po- postdocs, um, you know, like professors even, um, and they will come to us when they have a problem that they can't figure out a, sol- a solution for, basically. And we uh, we work with them to try and solve it. So, um, basically, the, the Hat Fellows sort of work have worked across you know, multiple sort of disciplines, and um, we sort of identify solutions that other people you know they can't see because that's sort of yeah, very focused mm. in their sort of in their sort of project or their sort of uh, research area, um, and yeah. Yeah, no. So it's kind of like uh, enablers for all sorts of different projects, right? Like it's, yeah, uh, it's just that like when when you hear the word hack, everyone would probably have in their mind, you know, some some guy behind a laptop uh, trying to hack into the Pentagon or something. But, um, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you've got like, yeah, the good the good hackers and the bad hackers. We were definitely on the on the good side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um so you mentioned a lot of these different uh, projects that you do, and um, so sort of what what techniques then? Um, you say all different kinds of research. What techniques do you, would you would you use? And maybe um, if you could give a few examples of some of the projects that you've helped to hack, like your favorite hacking project that you've done so far. Yeah. So so a, a lot of them. Um... I mean, it really depends upon upon what sort of the, the the people have, what the researchers have, and what they don't have. And in a lot of cases, what we've been finding is that a lot of people they have um, all of the uh, all of the equipment and and reagents and like accessories and whatever required for doing you know uh, you know in particular sort of lab work. So sort of like you know ke- like chemistry or biochemistry or like sort of bio bioengineering sort mm. of type um, type work, but they don't have um, anything for working on on sort of uh like physical prototypes or electronics or mechanical items or anything like that we, we find that a lot a lot of people come in um come into the space with that sort of issue you know they, they they tend to be from that sort of that sort of background and they need a, a solution like a piece of equipment uh to modify a piece of equipment um to get the res- to get results that they could, that they couldn't get before mm. um i mean that's you know the majority, I would say, of people that come in that do that. We but we get the other side as well because we also have, um, you know, we have a small sort of wet lab area which you know we can support. So I suppose more basic chemistry, but also like biochemistry type projects as well. Mm. And that's you know of interest to people who don't have access to that sort of lab space because 
if you don't work in a if you don't work in a in a lab, you don't have access to a to a lab. I mean, they're very expensive things to come across. Um, so that tends to be you know th that would tend to be more focused on sort of I suppose start the you know, startup ideas. So sort of uh, that student based like biological startups, we you know get projects through that are interested in that space because you. You, know, you don't get that lab space anywhere else. So, no, you don't. It's so, all. Yeah. It's awesome to that 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 is on offer, really, because a lot of people will ha have had these ideas, but it's very difficult to to actually put it into practice, isn't it? And or to sort of like get that first. Like, let's say you've got an idea where you want to, yeah, do some sort of bio project. You want to use. I don't know if you're allowed to even use CRISPR in this in in your wet labs, but if you wanted to use CRISPR for whatever reason, you know, you, yeah, you would you would have have uh, the opportunity to be able to at least try it out. Because you, otherwise, it would just never get off the ground. So, I this is what the hack space was sort of intended for in the first place. Kind yeah. Of like, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So it's it's sort of, um, I mean, it, it gives people the opportunity to work work in disciplines that they that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. But also, it's it's because it's because it's this sort of freely available space to anyone at Imperial. Mm. It's um, it also just removes that that cost barrier of having an idea as well. So yeah. if you mm. um. So, so, so one of the major problems. I mean, so, so obviously we have, you know, the research side is okay because there's there's research funding, and so they can afford to to pay for things. But if if anyone is sort of in the, um, perhaps like a, a student who has a research idea, and we get those, we get students who have that they basically you know run run their own research projects, which is pretty much unheard of. But they, we can support that, <laughs> and and also like the the startups as well. So this could be you know, any sort of startup. It costs money to to start up a, you know, to. Yeah, start up a new venture and to to get get your idea like you know initial idea tested and, and built and uh, you know no matter what it is um, and by providing this this space and basically the expertise within it um, and and the equipment it means that if you have an idea uh, you can test it like very very quickly uh, because we like people to test things very very quickly and we help them to do so and, and but also it doesn't cost a lot of money so it means that if you've got an idea which doesn't work you don't end up losing losing out. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, one of the problems with, um, you know, I mean, probably I'd say a main thing which, which would be holding a lot of people back is like the sheer cost of like, you know, research and development. And mm. we we get people in, they do the research and development and, you know, they've spent, you know, a few hundred pounds. The idea maybe doesn't work. It's like, well, it doesn't really you know, it's not the end of the world. Come up with another idea. It's brilliant. It's, it, this is sort of it's kind of like what. I always thought the idea of academia was when I first uh, entered, and yeah. obviously the you know it's 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 kind of different. You get taught by experience that it's not it's not quite this utopia, um, but the hack space. So I, like you and I have um, worked on a couple of projects together now, and I've always been like incredibly impressed. I've always felt like I wasn't. Uh, able to sort of like get help outside of my discipline particularly and yeah, yeah that I, I as a you know a plug for the hack space I can personally vouch for it, you know you guys being awesome at it but the, I was all I was very I was very cynical at first just because like okay just plainly put who offers a free service where people can give you all of this help? Like, who's footing this bill? Um, where does that Where does that come from? There's got to be someone's trying to like have some sort of. They're going to make money out of me somewhere. Like, why is it all free? I don't understand. So, um, so how how is how is the hack space like sort of like briefly able to support all of these projects? Like, yeah, think, yeah. Well, you got some so, rich so, benefactor, I mean, well, or <laughs> yeah. Well, well, no, no, not at all. I mean, we don't we don't get a lot of money at all, considering how much we can we we do for it. <laughs> Um, yeah. uh, no, so so we we do obviously because we so fortunately be, because we are a part of um, a part of Imperial College. So obviously we were only open to to Imperial College uh, researchers, but you know we do. Um, so th th things like providing like you know project support and research support uh, are like to to you know those sorts of members are obviously free, but the, there are other times when like the. Um, where th things are charged, but these would be like in specific items, you know, maybe, but perhaps this is like an, an external, um, mm. uh, where, where there'd be like a, you know, pro project specific, um, like sort of charge for that. So, um, yeah, so, so fortunately, uh, you know, because it provides, uh, like such a benefit to, to Imperial College, like, um, like students and staff, yeah. uh, you know, we can, we can provide that, um, 
Mm. So but yeah, like I said, we we don't actually get a lot of money. <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, so you're still just, trapped just, in academia, we, yeah. <laughs> we, we we are yeah we we just try and punch well well above our our weight. <laughs> yeah, fair fair enough. That's also part of the fun as well. Like, there's a, I mean, what fun would it be if everything was well funded? Uh, you know, you wouldn't. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I, I, so I suppose. I mean, the thing is that that there's the solutions to problems often don't don't need to. Um, uh, don't need to cost a lot of money. So, mm. um, I mean, there isn't. It's it's not necessarily de- detrimental when when you can't spend a huge amount of money on something. Yeah. Uh, but there's so also in terms of the outcome. Yeah, there's also this huge element of uh, creativity as well because, like, problem solving. You, I guess, like, when people come to you with project ideas, you don't. You really don't know what the project is, and um, or like sort of. You know, you don't really know what the sorry, not the project, the problem is, uh, and you'd have to like think of lots of different ways that the other person, like you're coming at it from a different approach. So yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a very sort of like creative process, uh, and it, it I don't know, I, I just don't, I'm just wondering how, how can you, if if there are any listeners out there who want to be prospective um, hackers or hack fellows, uh, how what's the training that you sort of need to become a hack fellow? Is there any yeah, training? Well, I, well, I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's a training. Is a yeah, not, I suppose not quite the. the it's the, not the right, the right word. word. Yeah. I mean, um, so I mean, it, just you know, I'm 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 a biologist by by training, and and as you know, and projects that we've worked on, I haven't been working on on the biological part. I've been helping you, you know, design mm. injection molded plastic plastic yeah. parts, which is yeah far outside of any 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 official training I've I've had. Um, I think like what we have got is uh, I suppose that we've all had some degree of experience in in working across disciplines before we sort of before we was taken up the role so so uh, like however we'd get that experience so you know I, I obviously had um experience in in biology and biochemistry before but like as a result of some hobbies I've, I've, you know amassed a whole bunch of uh, you know experience and like in other things before I'd, I'd taken up the role mm. um so it's yeah I, I think it's it, it really is it's I, I think the important thing and something that we in terms of like people that work there so there's sort of the, the sort of research mindset that you get so from also from, from research backgrounds you know other hack fellows from research backgrounds as well mm-hmm. but the way you think about something in research is is very similar to how how we sort of would go about projects uh at the at the hack space mm-hmm. as well so mm-hmm. you know in, in research you want it's like well i need to figure out if this is going to work and i need to figure out if it's going to work as fast as possible spending as little money as possible because I need to get a publication out. Yeah. Right? So, um, and it's the same. It's really the same sort of uh, same sort of mindset. So I need to figure out whether this idea works, and I need to do it as quickly as possible and for as little money as possible. Um, it's so I think that that sort of um, that, that that sort of mindset, that research sort of focused like mindset, is is probably quite important. I think in terms of being able to sort of look at the picture and the big picture and figure out how to go about the problem. Mm. I mean, one one thing that we definitely find is that when when a person will come into us for with a problem, they'll come come to us with it. It'll be a very specific problem, uh, and and they'll say, "I need to three D print a box <laughs> that holds isopropanol and dry ice." And you say, "Well, uh, okay, why why why, yeah. why do you need to do this sort of thing?" It's like, "Well, I need to keep." An aluminium plate cold. It's like, okay, well, why do you need to keep an aluminium plate cold? It's like, well, I need to put a hydrogel on top of it. It needs to be cold. So, like, okay, well, why do you need to do that? Mm. It's like, well, I'm building a cryo printer. It's like, well, you should have said that at the start. Exactly, yeah. And we would have like missed out that whole thing and started from first principles and, yeah. and helped you to do it. So, so um, yeah, we do. We find that people sort of have a preconceived idea as to what the solution to a problem is, but they they we t- kind of go back. And then we find out the right solution, and we help them help them in that way. Um, and it's it's not surprising that you know people only they can only sort of think around, around things that they know, uh, you know, and they've seen. Yeah. Whereas if they come to us, then we have seen a lot more. Yeah, and, definitely. You know, You've got different experiences. Yeah, different experiences. But obviously, people will always try and, at least in research, I find like people are more the type to try and solve it themselves because um, that's what they're you know taught to do that's what they're encouraged to do rather than to seek like you know there's this sort of like a pr- protective aspect of your project within academia yeah, so to, that's 
it, that, 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 that's certainly true yeah and, and i think it's that's that's more so it, it depend, does depend a lot on the research groups and i think it does depend a lot on the the institution as well mm. so um where that, that sort of uh you know that you have that sort of uh that sort of mentality that this is mine nobody can see it don't want to get scooped like yeah it's it's um, real but, fears they're real fears yeah. you know <laughs> but uh, but also this is what this is where i mean i think this is this is where why why it's harder to get help outside of research like you mentioned before mm. you you know you're surprised that, that you know you could go to the hack space and we would offer support because, yeah, yeah no it's, one else would. it, it and, is odd it is odd uh, you know <laughs> like the fact yeah, that there are I mean, these people who will give their time up for free and who will come up with these creative solutions like um you know yeah for the project we did that you know i i had a, an idea of mine but you guys like uh made it a whole lot better basically so it was yeah i was i, I was uh, ple very pleasantly surprised and it's all worked out like really really well so yeah but it's it, the idea that it's even there it's still i still struggle to, com to comprehend it really to be honest so but it's yeah it's brilliant it really is Could, have you got some examples of sort of like your favorite projects that you've worked on or yeah, like, pro like I mean... really shining examples that have done incredibly well or maybe startups or just projects you're particularly proud out of yeah so um i mean my, my favorite one at the moment is uh which is i mean this is this is still ongoing but it's it's, it's at its first prototype stage and it's it's um mm. it's working like actually working very well so this is like a project uh so working with um a phd student in uh in the chemistry department mm -hmm. and they're trying to so they're trying to make um like very very precise um uh like measurements like across it's, it's basically across sort of a, a sort of synthetic sell uh, like effectively is what they're trying to do okay. um and it's and they need a, a very small spectrophotometer that can measure in very very precise locations um and mm. effectively they're designing like the system to do that and this is a com commercially available solution well not really commercially available solutions but you know the, the, mm. the closest equivalent costs a lot of money and doesn't work doesn't work very well okay um uh, and this application so so basically this is a you know project yet yeah, has like yeah, also like aspects of like design like mechanical assembly electronics like coding Ooh. and um and i've actually seen the, the first set of data from it and it's like it's it's, it's really quite impressive and this is the, the, these are things you know you know we, we sort of walked around the workshop pulled out a few piece, a few parts that have been scavenged from something and that's that's where the, the major mechanical parts come from so you know, it's probably built it for the cost of you know 20 20 or 30 pounds this piece of equipment that rivals something which wow. commercially doesn't work very well it costs 20 and and he's already <laughs> getting and the thing is it's it means that he can get data which is otherwise impossible to collect yeah so you know you, you this is this this is like you know supporting research to mm. do things that can't be done um and this i think this is why we, we see quite a few researchers and and like that type of field because you know that's you know everyone you know research is all about doing um doing things that haven't been done before yeah and this is um and the only way you do that is by obviously doing something that, <laughs> that has... hasn't been done before using equipment that hasn't existed before yeah and you know we can really help with that and i think it's um and obviously it's i i, th I think people don't realize how how easy it, and, and how quickly you can easily and quickly you can do it mm. you know they, they sort of when you look at I think probably you know a lot of people now they look at like something a, a piece of any any sort of item of equipment it's like a box it's got some switches and buttons on it and some inputs and outputs and whatever mm -hmm. it's like well I don't I've got no idea how that works inside it's, <laughs> but like when you've when, when you've sort of worked with a few things it's like well yeah I, I can see exactly how they've done that and yeah. I don't understand why it costs so much money and why it doesn't work very well <laughs> so uh, yeah so okay so so with all of these like amazing solutions um so some American universities I'm not particularly sure how it works in the UK uh even though i am english um is that uh they have these technology transfer entire teams or units and people who sort of like deal with with patents and i know imperial sort of have this with imperial innovations um and i'm not sure if other universities in the uk have it you, you might be better placed to, to answer but for these little technologies these new sort of like inventions that you've made uh so this you know the the more precise miniature spectrophotometer is this not something that could then be commercialized? I'm sure there's other people with similar problems. So yeah. uh, uh, what's the sort of like the pipeline or, or is there a pipeline to, to sort of like get these into commercial development and yeah, spin out companies and stuff? 
Yeah, well, I mean, yes, yeah, so certainly there is. So, so we do fall within the hack space falls within what's called enterprise, which is um, which basically does sort of cover that 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 side of things. So, um, so in terms of in terms of that further development, so so where the hack space sits is, I suppose, where the where that first that first layer of verification, right? So, um, so if you if you have you have an idea for a technology. Um, and we can check whether that's whether that's actually viable, right? And and if mm-hmm. it's not viable, then then you know you, do, you could do something else and come up with another idea. And if it is, then then you can sort of work through it, go through like some initial prototypes, and then there are like um, then then with like within enterprise, you can think about like sort of scaling further. So once you, you know, get into your like yeah. potentially even like you know business business planning and, and those sorts of um, those sorts of ideas. So we. We sort of work hand in hand with um, with other parts of like en- enterprise, so yeah. where we can help with one side of it, and they can help with more. The yeah, you sort of like um, the interface, I suppose, between researchers and uh, who who have got ideas, or, or even students, obviously, who, who have ideas, and then you know putting it into action, getting these new projects up and off the ground, and then uh, yeah, I suppose you can feed it into this this enterprise team. Is yeah, it's it's really cool. So this next section is called When You Were Young. So David, uh, where did you grow up? Where are you from? Uh, well, I'm from New Zealand. So, um, mm-hmm. so I grew. I was born in in uh, a city called Wellington. Um, okay. I spent most of my sort of uh, ch- childhood there. Lived in in, uh, in Christchurch for a while uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, it was just like yeah, what, uh, did you did you do your undergraduate in New Zealand as well, or did you? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I did my undergraduate degree in uh, so that was at Victoria University of Wellington. So, mm-hmm. uh, so my undergraduate degree was in bi- biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, so after it was only after that uh, when I moved to um, start looking at doing a like a, a PhD. So that's when I moved to the UK. So mm. um, so I did my PhD at the that was at the University of Bristol. Um, and that was in um, protein X-ray crystallography. Mm. So, um, in in sort of like this this big move from uh, uh, across the world uh, to Bristol, did you always have in mind that you wanted to to move to the UK to do it? Was it? Did you always have in mind firstly that you wanted to do a PhD? Um, were you sort of like focused on that, or yeah, like how, how did you how did it play out? Yeah, I mean, so it was. I don't think I always had in mind that I wanted to do a PhD, but I did realize that um, that moving on to, to to work in a normal sort of job wasn't really going to be uh, challenging enough in, in the right yeah. ways that is. So yeah, yeah. so and um, you know, and, and I think that's I, I still think that's true now. Like um, you know, academic research is there isn't really anything that compares with the the intellectual challenge of it. Um, mm. so I, I was not interested in working in a job that I would be, that I would be bored at, uh, yeah, I fair wanted enough. to be, I wanted <laughs> to be challenged and that was, like, so obviously that was pushed, that's going to be like a research position. Mm. And so then it's, uh, obviously you are going to do a PhD. Um, so in terms of like moving to the UK, no, mm. I mean, it was certainly when I was, when I was applying for my PhD, I was, I was looking for a, uh, you know, a, a position um, it was like possibly in the US, possibly in the in the UK. It was okay. you know, I hadn't set my set my mind on the UK until sort of a bit a bit later on um, when I started to get into the sort of serious applications. But um, but yeah, I sort of you know, and I wasn't a hundred percent sure as to like exactly what what field I wanted to do in. And it was yeah. I think it was yeah the the, the, the the um protein crystallography is sort of what it's it attracted me at that time because it was. In a way, it was um, there's it's there's a lot of uh, sort of engineering sort of associated with it, which I realised was you know had obviously had an interest in because it's all like protein engineering and getting things to work the way that you that you you know you need them to work in order to um, to get results. Mm. So you know I was I was very interested in, in that sort of aspect of it at the time. Okay, so so the protein uh, crystallography is is just working out the the structure of certain proteins, right? Yeah, so, so, so yes, it's a structure. What, mm. So, well, what what and, what were you looking at? Which protein were you looking at? 
Uh, well, there, there were there were a range of them. So obviously, um, as I don't know, you probably know, like this PhD that you start is not necessarily the one that you. Mm. It's not necessarily the, yeah, the yeah. one that you end. The projects projects change and they morph and and whatever. So the um, yeah, they're actually working on it, on, it, on some um, some proteins involved in. They're actually involved in the floral signaling pathway in plants. Is is what I okay. ended up working on, um, which is a, 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 a you know the small step away from what I started, but the thing is, the principles are all, all the same. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that was, um, yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, I suppose. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I presume your your experience of PhD is the same. A PhD teaches you to teach yourself how to do everything that you need to do. Um, is the main definitely the main skill set that you get from doing a PhD. Um, uh, yeah. No. Well. Yeah. I mean. Uh, for, yeah. For me, definitely. Like, uh, there's, you get the skill set, but. Um, I've gone way outside of the the remit of my project, having to do all this bioengineering stuff. Which again, like you've you've helped with, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd still be struggling to do it by myself. So I'm obviously like very grateful. But yeah, PhDs really don't. Pre- well, they they prepare you for the, like the unexpected, I suppose. Right. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that the way, yeah. I mean, I've always found that that the way you sort of look at things, having completed one is you, you then come across something that you don't know how to do, mm. but you know that you can figure out how to do it. Yeah. Exactly. And so, yeah. you know, it's like, well, I don't know how to do it, but I know I can teach myself by going through, like, you know, re- reading all the appropriate materials. And, yeah, for and sure. And then I will be able to do what I need to do. Um, and I think that's I think that's the main skill. It's like, um, yeah. it's obviously, I suppose it depends. Some people, are, their PhD is probably a bit more constrained. Um mm you know they have more sort of you know direct micromanagement type supervision which you know i fortunately didn't didn't have i always uh had a lot of freedom in mine um but Good. um yeah i mean i think it's it, it certainly it did certainly set me up for sort of um you know future like future research and also like the, obviously the hack fellow role I yeah think. So, so we'll come on to the hack fellow in a bit, but I, I had another question just about your your transition. Um, did you go directly from this uh, bachelor's into PhD, or did you um, did you take a bit of time out? Like, because you know, New Zealand is one of these places that's like a beautiful like country. I really, really want. It's like after my PhD, I want to spend a couple of months going there and just sort of like traveling around and doing all of these going to hobbiton you know learning scuba diving <laughs> all this kind of stuff um so did you like take a little bit of a break between um well only so 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 i mean yes and no so only the only reason i took a break is because uh the terms are six months off um between okay. uh the southern hemisphere and the the northern hemisphere so um oh. so the academic year starts at a different time so so could so you explain I, that a bit just because like i don't know how it, i have no idea how it works like um yeah yeah so well the, the main so the academic year starts after the, the summer term but of course the summer is is uh is over christmas time mm. and so your academic year in the southern hemisphere starts and sort of you, you, you know students have come in, in february time um, so, so I had finished my, uh, finished for the academic year, uh, when I finished my, um, my BSc honors, and then there was a, 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 a short gap, um, before I had to start the PhD. So okay. I did have some time, um, I, the only thing I used it for was to save up enough money to enable me to get a student visa to, oh, <laughs> to, okay. to oh, yeah. come to the UK because there's their, I don't know, their requirements for having a certain amount of money. Uh, um, so, so it, it wasn't a particularly, uh, it wasn't, I suppose, a particularly interesting use of time. No, it's, um, it, but, was, it was, it was, it was a very, you needed that though, right? Like, that's, yeah, that's I definitely, I did, yeah. I, I did need the time. I, I, yeah. Um, wow. Uh, so yeah, it was very, very like happy, very glad to have it. Otherwise, yeah, I would have had taken more out. Um, but I, I suppose also, um, yeah, you know, you talk about going to visit visit mm. New Zealand. I mean, remember, I, I I grew up there, so I'd already done, I already, already <laughs> travelled around, and you don't, yeah, you sort of don't, you don't, you don't realise uh, what's on your doorstep. You know, it's always, uh, it's only after you leave that you think, oh, I wish I'd gone there. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you think all of these like wonderful places. Because again, I've been like researching it and seeing all of these different like bays. I can't remember what this maybe it's called tasman bay i'm not 100 percent on that now uh now that i've said it but um it, it just looks beautiful and i i want I, I like i really really want to go um yeah uh 
I, I suppose like yeah uh, it's, it's the it's, so for me I'm, I'm from sort of like uh, northwest and I uh, like we're really near to the um, the Lake District but I've only been to the Lake District like a handful of times and then you know people who come to the UK they go there holidaying there like all of the time and yeah, oh, it's yeah just... I, I, I love the Lake District it's like my favourite you, part you, of the you, you've probably been yeah. more than yeah. I have then, like, because I've literally <laughs> been like three or four times but it's yeah. only an hour's drive away so it's yeah it's poor showing really poor poor showing um (laughs) yeah um uh yeah but then uh, in in terms of um this uh sort of like the 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 move um from new zealand to the uk you moved here you moved directly to bristol and then you were in bristol for for the for the full was it a three or four year phd or uh, it was three and a half years. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, so 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 yeah, it's, it's in Bristol. Um, you know, completing that you know, the, the usual you know, you know phases of going through a PhD of like excitement at the start, and then yeah. just you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then, then then like you know, d- d- depression in the middle as you realise that you're struggling to get the result any results, and then finally like oh definitely, I don't know. it's the five stages I, I of grief. Say, like it's like the five yeah. stages of grief, you know. Like yeah. You really, yeah. yeah, you go through them all totally. Yeah, I've, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and, and and then finally finish and then realize it's like, oh, well, that was. Well, I'm glad it's over, but like you know, I don't really care anymore. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's true. Um, very true. Very true. Um, yes. Which, sorry, go on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so 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 then I um I mean after after that is I sort of moved into a, like a postdoc at um. Uh, so this was actually also at the University of Bristol. So this okay. was in, um, so it was it was uh, membrane protein biophysics that I was working on then. So it's more of a sort of a, a like biophysics type, um, uh, yeah, type project. So so looking at you know something called protein folding, which is you know how 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 proteins go from the sort of nascent chain into their their, their yeah folded and fully functional forms and oh, like okay. what causes. Um, yeah, what what are the requirements of that? So trying to trying to investigate that, which was you know a very quite very very challenging field because um, if anyone, I mean, if you work on membrane proteins, you know that they um, they are even more difficult to work on than other parts of bi- biological systems um, because you can never get the the environment quite right for them. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I've not worked so, so much on proteins, but I can I can imagine it's very it's very tough. I don't like imagine it like how would you even work out how something folds? Like how... well, it's it's yeah. They're, they're, I mean, there are a range of sort of experiments you do, and that they typically involve like uh, you know engineering of, of like parts of the protein or engineering of the protein environment, which is I suppose one advantage of working with membrane proteins. You can do that by changing the membrane properties. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it is. I mean, obviously. As with any type of research, you're collecting results and 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 finding the the answer that fits those results best. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. you 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 know, you can never be a hundred percent sure of that. You know, your interpretation is the correct one. You can only be you know have a certain amount of confidence that like what your interpretation is the best one that fits everything that you're observing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so then after this post, so how long did you stay in this postdoc for? Uh, I was there for a little while actually. Actually, I, um, it was about it was six years. Um, so working in in that group on those, um, like in that field. But I mean, that was you know that I obviously learned. I mean, it is. I mean, really, it was. It was. Uh, there were a lot of new techniques that I managed to pick up while doing that. Um, mm. And which is, it then set me up for sort of my next my next position, which was actually also which was at Imperial College as well. So mm-hmm. I had previously worked in, in Imperial College in the chemistry department. So and the the project I had there was um, uh, so this was this was working in the group of um, of Oscar Sez, who's who's actually currently the, the head of chemist the head of chemistry at Imperial mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was this uh, it was a synthetic biology project. So um, mm. it was basically a ground up design of um, synthetic biological systems, and this was it was one of those. If if you think about when you're a child and you think of what scientists do, mm-hmm. this this is what that that job was. It was it was. <laughs> right. It was yeah. It was it was it was like this is so ridiculous that it's you know it's, like it's how so, do you mean sort of what, like what, what, like what do you mean like, is it like building Legos or like what yeah pr- pretty much that was that was it it was it was like you know basically think of like breakdown biology into Lego bricks and you're basically trying to figure out ways of assembling those into something which behaves like 
uh, you know, like building a building mm. something which behaves like like a living thing from scratch. I mean, they're very very like obviously simple parts, um, but you know, they were like first principles, and mm. you know, it was it was like it's like well, we could actually build something, and it looks like it's actually doing what we we've looks like we've designed and engineered like a system that behaves in a way that we want to do out of like biological components. That's cool. Um, that's really cool. So, yeah, so that... we're going to have um, Yuval Alani on, and uh, yeah. he's. Uh, I, I, I think he, he might be working on something similar with the, the synthetic uh, artificial cell. So, um, yeah. yeah, like. Uh, so he he was he was actually there at the same time um, as I was. Oh right, so, okay. So, so so we 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 actually overlapped in the same in the same group. So um, ah. he was doing his studying his PhD at the time. So I know you've all yeah. Ah, interesting. Yeah, it's a very small world when you start sort of talking to people about all these different things. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um. Uh. Yeah. So um. You were you were then postdoc in uh, Imperial and then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how how have you gotten to be a hack fellow? Like, how did the role come up? Like, were you did you start the hack space? Like, because I, 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 I genuinely don't yeah. know. Like, how did it how did it work? No, so so I had so um yes, yeah, so, so I had another role after that. So oh, I actually sorry. moved right. to yeah. So 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 after um after working at the chemistry department at Imperial, mm-hmm. so I was actually I was I was basically just offered a, offered a job out of the blue in in um in a research institute in Melbourne in Australia. All oh, right, so. Uh, which was which was a bit it was it was you know sort of a bit of a surprise but the thing is it was you know it it, it paid very well and it was yeah. like oh maybe maybe I, maybe I want to move back to that side of the world so oh, so I actually okay. took up like a position so working in a medical research institute and this was then going back to um, like protein structural biology of like it was like membrane protein structural biology so um, you know something which is it's a sort of you know fields that I've, I've been very comfortable working in before and mm. and um and i so worked there for for a while before um and oh, it was only okay. it was during the time that i was over there that the hack space um came into existence so i think it was so i think it was 2014 that was the, the initial origins of the hack space but of course it was not like the hack space that you'll see mm. um then it started like it started very small in fact had, like at the beginning it didn't really have any physical space itself it's and then it sort of developed and my understanding is it then sort of developed into like a, a little corner of, a, of an office i can imagine yeah. developed into like this the side of a room and then it, then it went into onto an, into a whole room and, <laughs> and then yeah uh, and then then, then then after that it got its own built it, or its own portion of a building which is is the one in white city that you've been to mm-hmm. so it's sort of yeah obviously started started small and then and then grew and grew and grew so so i had like i had heard of it um so when i was over in australia i'd sort of i'd seen um uh like i think it was the post on post on facebook uh, about like the hacks, and, and I was sort of looking at it. So I said, "Wow, this place sounds this place sounds amazing." And this was before it had even had, had even sort of expanded. And I said, yeah. "Well, this sounds really good." It's like I wish there was a place like that around when I was doing my PhD. Yeah. So I would have been there all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. it, you know, it's it's uh, yeah, it, um, definitely. And I'm trying to take advantage, like in the last like year of this PhD. So yeah, any other prospective Imperial PhD students, uh, definitely. Oh, that sorry, that's one <laughs> very quick side point. Is this is Hackspace like unique to Imperial? Does um. Do other universities have hack spaces? Uh, other universities have have spaces. Some of them are some of them are similar. Some of them have spaces called hack spaces, which are not, uh, you know, they're not as expansive as what we've got. Mm. Um, I think like UCL is, is has the Institute of Making, which is uh, you know, is, is which is a like very very similar type of thing. Okay. Um, to to the hack space. Mm. Um, so and, and other universities they do have yeah, like I do know that there are like hack spaces, but they they're not sort of don't sort of cover the, the sort of uh, sort of range of um, sort okay. of manufacturing capabilities that that w- that we sort of have. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Uh, but but even those, but even then, you can still do a lot. You know, with a few small pieces of equipment, you can still. You know, you don't need a lot of projects. We can help with the most basic things. So so you know, at, at other universities, even if they have a room with some three D printers and and laser cutters, you yeah. can. You can already start to hack your own hardware. Yeah, definitely. So, you don't actually need. I mean, obviously, it's brilliant to have like a, an entire building dedicated to it. But I guess the whole point in hacking is you just need a little three D printer in the corner of a room, don't you? You don't need yeah uh, so, all of the yeah. 
Yeah, for, for, for a lot. I mean, obviously, there, there are other projects where it's like, well, that's not suitable because mm. those materials are completely unsuitable for your usage. We have to make that by another way, or it's um, or, pre- or like in terms of precision. But, you know, they, they, these come to the sort of like slightly more advanced projects anyway. So, yeah. Um, so, um, so, sorry, yeah, going back to, so you were, you were working in, uh, in Melbourne and yeah. um, there's this idea of the hack space that's sort of been incubating. You've seen it on Facebook or uh, Twitter or, or, or wherever. And uh, you're sort of thinking, right, okay, this, this is really cool. So you got in contact with Oscar what? or... Yeah, well, no, no. So, so, so it, it's sort of like, yeah, you know, I sort of occasionally see that, see this information. It's like, oh, that sounds really cool. You know, that's, and then like you know, a year later, I'd see, like see something else and say, like, oh, well, that's that sounds like a like cool project. It's like, oh, like that that sounds great. And then like then eventually, um, some yeah, the, like uh, the job efforts. I spotted the job efforts on uh, like I'm pretty sure that's this is on Facebook. And these were these were for hack fellow roles, and these were the roles that were to take. Um, to work in the new space, so the white city space. Okay. So, um, so there there were a few roles which were you know, specifically made for when the hack space expanded out into into white city, and and so that is, and, and I sort of looked at that for a while, and I thought, oh, that sounds like a pretty cool role, and they got closer and closer and closer to the deadline, and I thought, oh, that sounds, yeah, that sounds pretty good, but I'm not sure. It sounds looks does look pretty good. Then the deadline went. Mm-hmm. And then it was ext- and then it was extended, and it was like, oh, <laughs> should I? Should I? Should I? So yeah, so eventually, so so I did. Like I thought, yeah, to, to, to take the plunge, like apply, but, you know, don't have to do anything. But, but that's a huge decision because you've you, you've moved back to the other side of the well. You're, I say the other side of the world. You've moved back to your natural side of the world, I suppose, um, closer to all of your family, and then you're now deciding to move away again. Um, yeah, that, that's a huge huge decision. Like. Uh, I don't know. Like, was it was just as simple as that? Oh, I'll just do it. Is that? <laughs> well, no. I mean, I mean, applying. So, so it was only it's only when you have to, when you accept the job that I suppose you're really making the decision. Um, oh, true, true. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, like like I said, it, it did take me a while. I did see the ad, and I and it did expire uh, before I applied before I applied for it when it was when the deadline was sort of ha- had been extended. Um, and so it was it was it was quite. I was thinking about it quite a lot before uh, before taking the plunge. Um, but yeah, I suppose there was, uh, yeah, in, 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 hi- in hindsight, there was, it was a bit spur at the moment. No, fair, to, uh, why me. not? Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it just seems mental. Uh, Cause like, yeah, it's so, it's so far, but yeah, no, if you, 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 yeah. you follow what you want to do, that's the, that's definitely the yeah. right, right approach, I think. And then yeah. you can consider everything else afterwards. And, and, <laughs> and I think also this was driven from, by, you know, I, I previously worked in Imperial college before. And, mm. and like I said, the, the job that I had before I sort of seeing as being this, this dream job as a scientist and so i had this you know this this view you know uh, you know when you're working at a, I suppose it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to describe and i don't know if you uh, like noticed this as well but when mm. you're you know when you're sort of working and, and research and you're sort of yeah reading up on it uh, yeah keeping up with current events and current papers mm-hmm. and you sort of see um you know like this, you see well there's all this amazing research going on in the world this is amazing uh, but then you go to Imperial College and it's like, well, there's all this amazing research going on here. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a plug for Imperial, but yeah, that is like the, the way that I was. Um, no, it, it's very true. It, yeah, you know, this is how I sort of felt, and mm. so, so, so actually, the, the opportunity to move back um, was like, yeah, yeah it, uh, you know, I couldn't. You couldn't. Yes, I would struggle to say no to that. So. Yeah, so uh, with the with the work that you're now doing at the Hackspace, this is now going off on a little bit of a tangent. But do you still um, do you still publish any any of the work that you do? Or because um, I, I guess what I'm sort of getting at is is what I wanted to maybe ask in the next section a little bit. But um, like yeah, like did you 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 made this decision to move from academia, which I, uh, which is what this institute in Melbourne was, to a role that is sort of academia but it's sort of like you know this interface like we were we were talking about so uh, i suppose at that point you decided that academia maybe wasn't wasn't for you um and again we can talk about this a little bit more uh later but is that is that you uh, were you sort of done at that point like when you when you when you wanted to move from melbourne no i i wouldn't say i was done with academia at that point um because i i did realize that this was still a role like working within like working with researchers and working in in uh in research and in and um and we are involved in like we we have had like a couple of a couple of papers um i've been involved in a couple of papers where like obviously uh you know so where we help with projects people 
people come in mm. and they decide they, they can't do it. We provide like a, like a significant intellectual contribution in order for them to get their work done. Um, then, you know, so we like have the hack fellows like do still, um, do still publish, even if the, you know, I suppose we, we don't have our own, you know, we're not our own principal investigators on our own research projects. Yeah. Um, I suppose principally, yeah, because we, we don't have time to, to work on that because we're too busy working on everyone else's, but, <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah, so, so we, so we still do. And that, that is something that, you know, we're obviously all like, we're all very interested in because, you mm. know, research is, is like, yeah, the, it is the state of the art stuff. Um, mm. and we're like, the, it is something that we, we find interesting to, to work on. And so, you know, we end up like helping out on in, in other research projects as like, you know, collaborators and get authorship. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Very final, because this section uh, has been really, really interesting uh, to find out about, um, you know, all of the decisions you've made and sort of where you're from, a little bit more about you. But let's close it out um, just by if, if you could provide what you think would be the best advice that you would give to anybody who's um, either an undergraduate, a postgraduate or like a postdoc. And, you, you know, these are all critical junctures in people's careers um or lives so what advice would you give to people at different stages uh at these different stages or would it all be the same uh yeah that's a that's a tricky one because of course you know you never know whether the decisions you've made have been the right ones yeah <laughs> so yeah. um yeah uh i would say um i think the things that i would find most important in any of these is like a role that you know, if we're talk, thinking of something in, in academia and you're talking about moving position in position, it's a role that's going to keep you, uh, like keep you, keep you challenged and like, and keep you happy. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I don't know what the advice would be to find that. Um, it's a, it's, it is a tricky one. You know, I've been in some ways I've been lucky, um, in that when I have done these large moves, I've moved, uh, without knowing what I'm getting into, it's turned out okay. <laughs> um, which is certainly uh, like is not always the case. Yeah. Uh, so I suppose be be wary, be wary of that. <laughs> yeah. No. But that's, I know. I know. I know that's like that's not good advice. But um, well, yeah. it, no. Like I, I think. Yeah. I mean, I guess you're sort of just saying like try, go go with what you think will make you happiest, right? And you you I, I also think that fortune favors the brave and it's uh, you've certainly been very brave in, in in a lot of your decisions so yeah perhaps that, that's that's the way it works yeah out. I, I, I suppose yeah that, that yeah um yeah I, I would yeah I would I would say that I mean I've, I've never been yeah I've, I've, I've never I've never been interested in in in, in well I've obviously you know working in academia I'm not interested in, in like money or yeah. or, or yeah. like huge amounts of material possessions but it's it's like I'm, I'm interested in yeah in obviously I, I I I enjoy the challenge the challenge is 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 what I look for. So for our next section, uh, we're going to talk all about your experiences in science. So, so let's start off with what has been your most memorable experience? Uh, so most memorable experience. Um, I mean, yeah, okay. That's a tricky, mm. that's a tricky one. But what sticks out um, most, most in your mind that you really enjoy? If someone says that, like, what was the best, the best times that you ever had as a PhD or yeah. a postdoc? Well, like, I, what do you... I mean, I, I think like, I, th I think I sort of like, you know, mentioned that bef before when I talked about my sort of dream scientist job, which I had in the chemistry department at yeah. Imperial, Imperial College before, which I was, you know, obviously incredibly lucky to be, to be involved with. Um, that's, that's the one that, sh you know, in terms of like experiences, that's the one that stands out. And the reason that it does is I think is because there's just, um, it's probably just because of the amount of autonomy that was provided with that. So that it was a, it was a situation where it was like, you know, a very, very sort of open-ended um, uh, or open project. And it's like, come up with the, with a solution to this. And it's, it's, it's where you sort of ha have the opportunity to, you know, it's basically run like, or where I had the opportunity to basically like, you know, plan and, and run the project as, as I would, as I would have done it. Mm. You know, plan, plan all the experiments that need to be done, design everything that needs to be done. Um, so th I think that that's the one that, you know, that kind of really, really stood out. Um, Fair enough. Okay. Um, 
How about the biggest challenge that you faced as a student? Uh, biggest, cha- I mean, the biggest challenge was definitely, um, yeah, that, that, that was definitely write, writing up a, a PhD thesis. So this was, uh, I mean, it was, it's a, it, it was one of those things. I was going to say so, it's a stupid um, question, but why? <laughs> yeah, stupid... well, I mean, the thing is, it's, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm not bad at writing, mm-hmm. and I'm not slow at writing um, either. Um, and you know, I think my, my standard of writing is is quite good. So yeah, there should not have been any problems with it. But I, I found that by the time by the time it got round to doing it, it was I uh, yeah I, I, I couldn't I couldn't focus on it I, mm. I couldn't yeah you know, I couldn't get the words down I couldn't get them in any sort of order it took me I mean it took me a long it took me it probably took me twice as long to write up as I was expecting and it's mm. you know it was it was it was really a struggle but um, you know you just had to get through it um, yeah admittedly I've never. Um, never read my thesis after after, <laughs> after writing it yeah. Uh, um, yeah. but yeah like I think that was you know it, like it's, it's, it's obviously like a, like a challenging thing um, like you know it, it was definitely the, the the hardest bit about um, about being uh, being a student of any sort I think mm. is it proudly on display somewhere your thesis or is it pro- propping up a table leg uh, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it, it is like I, I do. I do have it. I just don't don't ever open it. And I... <laughs> okay, fair, fair so enough. It's yeah. it's yeah. It's 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 visible whether that's proudly on display or not. As far as is, is open to interpretation. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Um, okay, so the so what has been the best piece of advice that somebody else has ever given to you that you've really taken to taken to heart? Yeah. So. Uh... I think so. I, re- I remember when I was when I was doing my BSc or when I was doing my f- for final year um, project in my BSc. So my supervisor at the time, he said he said don't ever trust anything that someone tells you unless you know it's true. Um, mm. And I think that was that was really really. I mean that was incredibly helpful for especially this was. I mean this it was referring to basically scientific research and and like what people have done. Mm-hmm. Um, but like really it, it's it you know, I've always kept that in my mind and it's always helped. And it always, and I don't know if you have experience of this when you get d- delivered a plasmid from a, from a collaborator and it's like, I'll just check that. Yeah. <laughs> so it, I'm, um, not with the plasmid in, in, per se, but I, um, I mean, I'm just a bit, I, I, I I'm, I'm very paranoid about things. I, I truly believe only the paranoid people survive. So, for instance, like um, in our tissue culture hoods, we have these uh, like autoclave tips that uh, pipette tips that go for autoclaving and then they get filled up. But if I go into the autoclave, uh, sorry, if I go into the, the, the tissue culture hood and I see that there's a, a box that's sort of been half used by the previous person, I just go and get yeah. a new box. Like I'm not trusting like who's who's done that before. I'll refill it, not a problem, but I'm not trusting. So, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean, definitely. I think only the paranoid... Yeah. Yeah, and, and, I've, and, and I've seen and I've seen people waste a lot of time, mm. um, you know, in situations where it's like you know you should have spent the two weeks just verifying that mm. before you moved on, um, and it's like you know, and they end up spending months and months and months, and it's like, oh, that's not what I thought it was. No, um, no, no, no. So uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's definitely. I mean, that's probably yeah the best piece of advice I had in academia, but probably generally just the best piece of advice I've had. So yeah, no, that's 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 definitely a, a thing. Yeah, like uh, it's it's supposed to be general life and work advice this, this podcast so yeah if yeah. you yeah any any advice that you that comes into your head just uh, drop drop it in um so then uh next question what has been the highlight of your career i think we already know the answer to this one from yeah, yeah. i think i think okay. i keep on going on about it so um <laughs> <Okay>. yeah <laughs> so let's let, <laughs> yeah sorry yeah yeah like, um so, so let's go for and again we might have already gone with this one but again uh maybe maybe there's a different answer uh, what's been the hardest decision of your career um yeah so so the hardest decision yeah i, I think it was it, it yeah the, the hardest decision was i suppose this the the the, most, the move to the the hack fellow so the the move sort of a bit further away from what i was used to um so yeah i mean obviously because there were you know there were other things as well it was the move around the to the other side of the world again mm, which you know yeah. although i was getting quite used to it by this point <laughs> um yeah <sighs> Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, you 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 do expect to move around um, in academia. You don't expect to stay in one place, but um, mm. you know that that was you know that was a bit of a jump. Um, you know, it's like, am I ready to to sort of 
you know, go to something which is which is a bit removed from what I know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I think I was. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. So, um, next one. Um, did your experiences as a PhD student or a postdoc in academia uh, dissuade you from wanting to continue on the academic sort of traditional tenure track route? Yeah, I uh, I would say that's I would say they did. Um, I mean, I found that, and, and this is something that we sort of touched upon before, and that is, like you sort of mentioned, it's very hard to find. You know, people aren't willing to help. It's very hard to get, mm. get help outside, or people aren't willing to seek it. Um, <laughs> and I, I found that quite frustrating. So I, I found I found this idea of these sort of like insular groups. You know, like fight. I suppose fighting over like grant money and fighting over resources. And it's like, well, this is not what. This is not an efficient way of doing things, and it's this not. is not what I. I'm not interested in. And I'm not interested in this. Mm. Like I, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to be this type of thing. I, 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 I enjoy. You know, I enjoy helping people out with their projects, and it was like I was in a, this environment where it's like that sort of thing was discouraged. Yeah, um, that's very true. So, okay. so yeah, like um, yeah, yeah. For- it's, I mean. It, a- 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 acad- the academic route is, you know, it is it is strange. I mean, for anyone who is not in who is not in in academia, mm. it's a it's a very strange beast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's I I don't think I'll ever understand it. To be totally honest, um, yeah, uh, it just seems everything seems counterintuitive. Uh, it really, it just really really does. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, then uh, to close out this section, then uh, what would your um, your top work life balance advice be uh, I mean uh, yeah okay so that's that's probably a tricky one because I'm not not particularly good at that sort of thing because <laughs> so as, as you probably as you probably know when you work in so you know if, even though you know, my job is you know this hat fellow role is I suppose different to a research role um, like as you know being a researcher that you your life and your work uh, become very intertwined and mm. your work never actually leaves you mm. it's always in your mind mm. um, so um, I mean I suppose this is uh, this you know, this is the reason for for going with something that you enjoy, because then when your work goes home with you, it's, it's, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't destroy your life. I mean, yeah, that's true. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, t- I tend to uh, I, t- I tend to spend quite a lot of time working, um, and mm. sometimes it's hard to focus on other things. Uh, yeah, no, so I, 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 I'm probably not for a very not good person to give work life and life balance. Uh, <laughs> okay, so how about things like stress management then because uh obviously it's it can be a very stressful thing to be thrust into an environment as a, as a phd student where you know as, as we were talking about everything is a little bit unsure there's these people who can't help you or, or won't help you or you, you don't know where to get the help um, all, all of those different scenarios um yeah it obviously induces stress uh yeah how, how how have you coped with with like stress and how have you um, yeah, how did you pull through? It? Like, what what's the sort of golden advice that you'd you'd want to sort of give to people? Um, if you've yeah, got it. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it, that can be a very tricky one because because there's it, in certain situations, you know, obviously it can help. So I'd, I'd say that probably um, in terms of you know like work related stress, it's always like actually having having peers uh, like alongside you that they have a similar, similar sort of mindset mm. uh, it helps to make things a bit more light-hearted but of course that's not a choice that you can make because you're not oh, necessarily okay. choosing yeah you know so, so yeah if those if that is available like, like i find that 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 does help to sort of sort of relieve stress a lot i mean like you know other than that sort of on a, on a sort of personal level so i enjoy like cycling and, and running and that's those i find that um the only time I can actually switch my mind off is if I do those things, mm. um, bizarrely. So they, they're sort of in your own space. No one can interrupt you. No, no one can call you. No one can send you a team's message. Yeah. Um, well they can, but they're not going to get no, an answer. Exactly. And yeah. you can't answer. So you're not going to stress about it. That's good. Um, yeah, that's very true. Taking so, your mind off. So, but you know, and that, that, that's sort of how I take, if I need to take my mind off something, um, outside of work, uh, mm. then, you know, you, that's something which is achievable, you know, it doesn't rely on anyone else. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, it, I think it's, it, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one because, mm. uh, you know, stresses are obviously, it all depends upon your like personal situation, personal work environment. Yeah. Very true. Uh, mm. so some avenues are, yeah, 
can be tricky. But you need an output. You need a you need a, a stress reliever. You need something where you can sort of blow off steam. Like that's. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that that yeah that that definitely that's definitely a, a helpful thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So I mean, once again, if you're a person who doesn't enjoy those things, I. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I suppose yeah, you know, find an equivalent, but mm. but yeah, the, I I find that type of activity is good because it's you, it's like an escape. Next section is called passions outside of science. So, David, you've already touched upon how you really like to do cycling and running, but. Um, sort of, is, what else do you like to do in your leisure time? Um, do you do you do this competitively, or is it just sort of like, a, yeah? Um, what, what do you what do you like to do? Uh, yeah, well, no, I, I used to, I used to do I used to run um, competitively, but uh, I had to stop as a result of injury. So mm. so now it's uh, you know I do these things as uh, you know just at a, at a recreational level, which is you know it's it's frust- it's frustrating in some ways because because I'm not as quick as it used to be, but also it's still, uh, it's, it's also, it's also, it's also more relaxing because I don't have to train for any, any particular events. So, um, so what did you um, used to do? Like, um, like cross country running or were you a sprinter or, uh, yeah, so long, long distance. Uh, and I did used to, so yes, uh, did always used to run cross country in the winter time as well. So mm. with like, um, you know, various like, yeah, sort of club level, um, like, um, competitions. Um, so yeah, but, uh, tr- trail running. So it's probably the reason, like I mentioned, I love the Lake District. Um, <laughs> so I used to do, I used to do uh, like a bit of trail running in the in the Lake District. So there, there's some, um, there's some really nice uh, uh, trail running events. Um, I, 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 yeah. I wouldn't know. I've never, I've really rarely been to the Lake District. I need to flip and yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, like tra- trail trail running is is uh, that that's that's what I love doing. I think someone yeah. So in terms of that. Um, it was my, mm. my cousin who said that like it was the phrase um endure the roads and enjoy the trails like is how mm. like how you should look at running so um, that's really interesting actually because for me it like sort of like trying to uh-huh, as a trying like because it's a it's very loosely but trying to keep fit during lockdown i've sort of been running around my local area and there's a couple of parks and stuff but it's just a bit like boring after you've done it 20 times and it's the same old scenery and the same uh, like i i just don't find it exciting and i always like going to new places to go to go walking but i've never considered going <laughs> it's never even popped into my head to go to a new place to do running like to go to the lake district to do running i think oh yeah well let's go for a nice walk around there or go to the yorkshire dales or to, or to do something like that but i've never considered running so that's Maybe, maybe I should. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, like, it's, it's, uh, if, if you get into it, like, uh, I mean, trail running is definitely, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's okay. really enjoyable, really enjoyable one. Yeah, something to um, bear in mind. Um, so, uh, I just wonder, again, because you do a lot of hacking in your, uh, professional life, do you, do you also do a lot of hacking in your personal life? Are you, what, you do yeah. i suppose it's not bringing stuff home but like yeah do you do you still sort of like i don't know yeah i don't know what do you do, you do? Uh, yeah yeah it's 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 the same so you know it's um when it, whenever if there's something that you that i need i mean i've always been interested in making things as well so you know like from like yeah a ch- like childhood yeah i was interested in i was interested in how things worked mm. um so you know i always used to take things apart when i was when i was small um and then you figure out like how they work and like how to you know fixing things and like it always had like an interest in that so um so yeah like i i at home like i always have like various i i have a bunch of projects on the go at any mm. one time uh some some of them are sort of serious and some of them are just because it's like oh i don't know how to do that so maybe i'll just you know make up a project so that i can sort of learn a bit more so okay so i think i've i've you know i've always had to you know an interest in in because i've had this interest in like understanding how things work i sort of have projects that will then you know like introduce me to those things okay so so, so have you got you any know, examples have, of these projects well, that uh, so, so yeah so i've never really worked on like i've never really spent any time working on cars you know i didn't really you know mm-hmm. obviously knew the basics of how cars and, and the different parts of them work but you know i never really spent any t- any any you know any significant amount of time mm-hmm like working on them or doing anything with them so so i built a car and now oh, wow. i know how and, and and so now i have a very good understanding of how everything works and how everything is put together and how everything comes apart um, oh that's really cool so, what, what sort of car was it 
Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's from a company called Westfield. It looks like a Lotus 7, if you're familiar with that type of design. It's, uh, okay, not, not 100% um, but, sure, but I'm sure some of the listeners are. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, a, like, a, like a catering. It looks like a catering. <laughs> so, okay. In which, if, if, in which, yeah, some people are familiar with. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah. oh, it, wow. it, doesn't have a roof or, it doesn't have a roof or doors, so... It's a, does it does it work <laughs> oh yeah 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 so it was i had it uh certified and made road legal um uh last year how so. can it be road legal without doors <laughs> yes you don't need to have yes, there's no requirement for doors what uh, and... really <laughs> yeah. what there that's... are requirements for all sorts there are there are all sorts of requirements that the, the, like seriously the the, the the manual that's um the testing manual to check whether it's it's road legal is something like 380 pages long so there's like a lot of requirements, but doors aren't one of them. So that's what? That's just stupid. Oh my <laughs> god! Someone needs to lose their job over that. That's awful. Again, <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, are you a passionate advocate for anything in particular? You don't have to be. Uh, so, yeah. so uh, like, what? 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 What do you? What well, do so, you so, mean? some people are really sort of like uh, passionate about. Um, uh, like getting STEM into schools or sort of like, uh, or, or, or sort of diversity. And I think it's sort of something in that everyone, I think in academia really has maybe in, in common, but some people can be particularly passionate and they go into yeah. schools and do talks or, you know, they, they do outreach stuff. Um, and I know you do it at the hack space. So maybe I didn't pitch the question in the right way. So, uh, but yeah, th- this sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, obviously, like, yeah. So, so I am interested in in um in getting young people into into STEM. Um, so so I tend to work. So I mean, you, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's a space right next to the hack space called the Maker Space, which does outreach for schools. Oh no, I don't. Uh, in particular, in, in particular, like schools around the, the local sort of area. So, um, they they sort of do or you know pre COVID um times they had these after school programs which were basically sort of mini versions of you know what what people come into the hack space to do um and i've always helped them out with like you know judging their their their, their maker challenges so which is you know and you can sort of see like with the kids there um they you know i I feel they're probably learning more in the challenges that the maker space is is running than they're probably getting it at their school Mm, definitely (laughs) definitely yeah Final section is all about your, uh, your your sort of like closing thoughts, your final thoughts. So um, this podcast, again, is aimed at young people, sort of people in uh, like early career researchers. So what would your advice be to young people uh, right now, considering the, the set of circumstances that we're that we're in with the uh, with the pandemic and everything? What would you what would you say to everyone? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's 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 probably quite easy to be disheartened by not being able to not actually be able to do anything. And um, uh, yeah, like in in terms of in terms of you know, if if you are interested in in like this sort of like hacking and, and making, um, it's it's very easy to do a lot of this stuff at least at the at the at the most basic introductory level from home. You know, there are there are solutions to even if you can't get to places. Um, yeah, I mean. Mm. it's it, it's tough like because people yeah they don't really it, it, everything's now more online so um did the hack space yeah. run anything online to, to... yeah so so like I, like i would say you know there are we did run things online we do still run things online as well so in conjunction because you know we're we're still not open to everyone um you know you being mm. like you know, involved in essential research uh permitted to like come into the hack space but people who are not permitted on campus for um because they're not like they they still aren't they still aren't allowed um aren't allowed in because the numbers on campus are still limited mm. um so yeah y- yes there are like obviously online events have grown like massively like sudden yes yeah, so, uh, like suddenly they've just like expanded yeah. like 500 percent over what they were before and yeah there, there is a lot that you can do online but I, like i think there's you know I, I i'm 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 a fan of like actually you know doing things doing things in real life so if, if there's an opportunity to actually do something from home you know um you know 
even if it's uh, you know co- cobbling together uh, you know some some prototypes, some electronics, you know, in, in your kitchen, then you know these these are achievable things to do yeah, at home. You, know, you can do you know tangible you know physical things. Like even if you still um, if you even if you still can't get sure. out to like spaces to actually do them. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, um, so then in science in general. Which emerging trend do you see as having the greatest potential uh, to affect change and and why? What are you most excited by? Uh, let's see. So, uh, right, I mean, so so one thing that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of trying to get excited by, but I, I'm still not quite there. So, um, like, I, I, I see, like, like bioprinting as, as being something. I feel that there's... At, at the moment there's like the the technology isn't right like there's something which there's something fundamental which is missing and i don't know what it is yet mm. but i feel that once what like once we sort of get over over some of the like fundamental constraints it's that that is going to have a huge impact mm. um so, so maybe stupid question but why why do you think it will have a huge impact Oh, well, I mean, I, I think like in terms of applications, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you think you could get down to uh, or you think you, you could you could actually get get, get you know, 3D printed tissues d- d- like diversified and, and accurate enough. Um, I mean, I, I think you, you, you're then looking at being able to, I mean, effectively play print repair parts. Um, yeah, for, yeah, imagine. Um, so uh you know at, at the moment like obviously you know there, there are uses in in like research uh like you know you can use uh, the bioprinters to print like you know synthetic tissues for research and that's that is like an application which is you know like perfectly useful but i think i think there's there there is a lot that can, that uh that could potentially be done there and mm. it's a field which is i mean it's still very much in its infancy yeah definitely definitely are you doing any bioprinting at the moment or is it just sort of some... so no, so that's something which we so so we haven't actually got like a bioprinter at the Hackspace, but of course, but we've had you know projects that have involved or a couple that have sort of involved uh, you know trying to develop something something novel um, yeah. in that regard. So yeah. Um, yeah, so it is something that like I'm interested would be interested to sort of expand that sort of part of it out. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Final question, which I asked to all of my guests: um, if you could do it all over again. What would you keep the same, and what would you change? Uh, let's see. I would, if I could do it all again. I mean, I, to be honest, I would keep a lot of it the same because Good. Um, uh, the thing is that you you sort of, if, if I sort of look back and I think, well, well, maybe I could have missed that out, um, mm-hmm. or maybe I could have maybe I could have done that instead. And, but then, but then you realize that the reason that you're at the point that you are now is because you did those things mm. and they gave you experience that you didn't expect to, that you were going to get. Um, and then you ended up like, you know, then I ended up where I am. So, so I think that, you know, every point, like, even though, you know, I suppose where I'm at is a bit of a tangent to where I sort of started. Um, I, I think that all of those, like every step sort of informed something, gave me some experience that then became beneficial for, you know, for like later stages. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can think of a, a, uh, yeah. of, of any changes I would make, e- even though my trajectory hasn't been all that linear. <laughs> no, that's perfect. I, I, yeah, um, that's completely fair enough thank you that's a wonderful place to end so thank you very very much for giving up your time again to speak to me really appreciate it thanks for all of you um your advice your your store you know the stories uh yeah thank you david cheers thanks alex so that's what it means to be a hacker if you've got any cool and interesting project ideas find yourself a hack space and go and get creative thank you very much to david for giving us this insight so next week on wednesday the 9th of june I'm going to be joined by Dr. Anna Poshaisky. She's an award-winning material scientist, she's a fellow science communicator, and she's a newly published first-time author. She's a general all-round rising star, and I'm sure we're going to be seeing her presenting science on our own living room TV screens anytime soon. So, I'll catch you then.